Lord be with you. And also Good morning to one and all on this, the third Sunday of Advent. Uh, we're getting closer and closer to that uh, great day of days when we celebrate the birth of Christ, the Messiah, long awaited by Israel and uh, still needed in our world today. Uh, welcome uh, to you who are at home online. We're glad you are joining us today. Uh, it's a beautiful day outside, and uh, what a great day to be alive uh, and to be grateful for the grace of God that, uh, that supports us in so many ways. So uh, we're also glad to have uh, some new choir members uh, today, uh, Mark Johnson and Karen Dukes. God bless you for your uh, due diligence, and we welcome you to our, our choir loft. Uh, just if you see any mice, just kind of let them go by. They're, they're very friendly, okay? So uh, we're, we're, we're glad to have you. <laughs> uh, they tend to hang around in the alto section. So anyway, um, let us begin as we light the third candle uh, in our Advent candle today, the, the joy candle, the pink one. And Betsy and Wilson Moore will come and lead us in this part of our worship. Prepare the way of the Lord. Let us sing praises to the Lord, for God has done glorious things. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Let us shout aloud and sing for joy. For great in our midst is the Holy One of Israel. Let us worship God together. Trusting in God's salvation, God's faithfulness and merciful love, let us now confess our sins together using the corporate prayer printed in your bulletin to be followed by a moment of silent and individual confession. Let us pray together. 
Merciful God, we confess that we have often neglected our role in caring for your abundant creation. We have ignored the cries of the hurting and the lonely. We place our desires over the needs of others, and we have not prepared a way for the Lord with our words and deeds. Grant us your mercy and forgive our sins. Lead us in the paths of righteousness and compassion, guided along the path Jesus blazed for us. Hear our prayers, O Lord, both spoken and silent. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Surely God is our salvation. We will trust in the Lord's goodness and therefore will not be afraid. Friends, believe the good news. In Christ our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift. Amen. And now may the rich and abiding peace of Christ be with you all now and forever. Please bow your heads while I read the prayer for illumination. Help us, Lord God, with the aid of these scriptures to see you with light, which no darkness can put out, and to hold fast to your love, which is an anchor, sure, and steadfast, through Christ our Lord. Amen. I am reading today from Zephaniah. It is found on page 877 in your pew Bible, if you'd like to follow along. I'll be reading from chapter 3, verses 14 to 20. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst. A warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear, bear reproach for it. I will deal with your oppressors at that time, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you home. 
at that time when I gather you, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth. When I restore your fortunes before your eyes, said the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you 
thinking of the great gifts you gave to the world. Last week's second lesson, I forgot, I was just thinking, did I forget the anthem? And I, and I, and I did. I, we were on the same page. Okay. Where, where that there it is. Thank you. Last week we heard uh, John come on the scene quoting Isaiah that the Messiah was on his way and his job was to prepare the way. And so this is really the second half of that occasion where all of Jerusalem and Judea were going out to hear John preach about repenting of sins and receiving God's forgiveness and being baptized in the Jordan River. So uh, John is not exactly a polite house guest in this passage, uh, so uh, uh, be prepared, you're forewarned. John said to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, uh, translated a bunch of poisonous snakes, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, oh, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. Even now the ax is lying at the root of the trees. And every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds ask him, what then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none. And whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? 
He said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats of false accusation and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the, his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So, with many other exhortations, he, John, proclaimed the good news to the people. This is the word of the Lord. Be well, I hope you're ready for Christmas. <laughs> if you're not, um, <clears throat> welcome to the club. <laughs> you know, in the old days, I used to <clears throat> spend a lot of money on gas and, and uh, uh uh, wear out my legs walking up and down the mall. Now I, now my fingers cramped from hitting the, the send button. <laughs> uh, how <clears throat> how our world has changed in so many ways in the last few years. So this morning we're here to talk about John. Uh, in my book, a real mensch. If you're not familiar with the Yiddish language, a, a mensch is a really stand-up person. A person of great honesty and integrity. Someone you can rely on to tell you the truth and not to let you down. Uh, sadly, they are far and few between. John was a team player and could be counted on at all times to do the right thing. Now, one might have expected him to have let this w wild popularity and success go to his head. After all, the word on the street was that he might be the Messiah. And it would have been easy for him to have believed that. But John would have none of that. He set the record straight by saying God had sent him to prepare the way for Jesus, whose sandals he was not worthy to untie. That was a, that was a servant's job. He was the warm-up band for the main act, not the main act itself. Yes, John was a real mensch, and he paid for it with his life. When he preached truth to power and criticized the evil behavior of Herod's sister-in-law, Herodias, she tricked him into killing John, proving once again that no good deed goes unpunished. Now, as you can tell, John was not a feel-good preacher. Uh, he knew that God had sent him to comfort the afflicted, but to afflict the comfortable. So he blasted some of them who came out to hear him by calling them a, a brood of poisonous snakes. Now, when Matthew and Mark tell this story, they report that John leveled these uh, harsh comments at the leaders of Israel, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the the Episcopalians and Presbyterians of the first century. Um, not everybody, but here it says to the crowds, uh, he said this. John was accusing them of some very bad theology, assuming that their salvation depended upon their blood relationship to Abraham. Well, he told them to repent of such nonsense, reminding them that God was able to raise up children of Abraham from these very stones in the desert where he was living and ministering. One of Israel's great failures was coming to believe that God loved only Israel, whom God indeed had chosen as a special people, but not special because they were deserving of any special privilege or because they were a superior people to all others, but for a special mission, a job, to be a light unto the nations, shining the light on the fact, the beautiful fact, that God, the Creator, loved all people. They were to be an example 
for the rest of the world. So they too would be drawn to this loving, merciful God. So when John warned them if they did not repent from this bad theology and behavior, the ax was already laid against the roots of these trees and they would be chopped down and thrown into the fire. Mm. This must have gotten their attention because three different groups said, then what should we do? How, how can we fix this? Uh, reminds me of others who came to Jesus later on and said, uh, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? John told them to do what Jesus would later say, keep God's commandments. He told the general crowd to, to share of their abundance with those who have very little. If you have two coats or extra food, uh, share them with those who need them. An old Amish proverb that I have shared with you through the years is that if your chest of drawers becomes full, it's not time to build a bigger chest. <laughs> it's time to get rid of some, some of your uh, surplus clothing. To the tax collectors, most of whom were corrupt by design, uh, he told them to collect only what was prescribed and no more. And to the soldiers who had quite a bit of authority uh, and power backed up with uh, the sword, uh, not to take unfair, unfair advantage of people uh, uh, in their charge. So John called all people to produce good fruit, both Jews and Gentiles. Ethnic heritage was not a free ticket into God's kingdom. People needed to repent of the bad fruit in their lives so God's forgiveness could, could change them, transform them into healthy trees that produce good fruit. Uh, fruit worthy of repentance included uh, ethical uh, attributes like honesty and kindness and generosity and trustworthiness. And uh, that old, old commandment, the steadfast love of neighbors uh, modeled on the steadfast love of God. This is what Another tax collector, Zacchaeus, discovered when he met Jesus. That encounter unfroze his heart that had been hardened by years and years of greed and blind ambition. Which, after he received this marvelous gift of love from Jesus, uh, gave away over half of his net worth. This is the power of divine love. It can and does change us. Uh, just ask a uh, Ebenezer Scrooge. I still say he got that, uh, got that story from uh, Zacchaeus. Um, this is not to say that we have to earn our standing before God with good behavior. It does say, however, that salvation is based on God's gracious actions on our behalf through Jesus, the one for whom John was preparing the highway through the desert. God's unconditional unmerited love leads to a transformed life. Paul called that a, a whole new creation, a whole new creature, which enables us to grow little by little, day by day, in our love of God uh, and our love of neighbors. That's how it works. This wonderful cascade of love begins with God's grace. It, it transforms our hearts into new hearts making us into God's accomplices, which is in the process of transforming the whole world. Uh, if you ever dropped a stone into a, into a pond on a calm day when the water is uh, very glassy, it's, just, it's a beautiful sight. These concentric circles just radiate outward and outward, all because this one little stone dropped in its weight was able to transform that little body of water into a beautiful sight of expanding concentric uh, circles. Uh, maybe this is what Jesus meant when he said, if we have the faith of a tiny little mustard seed, we will be able to move mountains. Maybe that's what that means. The love of God in us is able to compel us to to follow the model of Jesus, and because of our behavior, the world around us begins to change. 
uh, and, and, and like God, this is a terrible analogy nowadays, but like a virus is set free to, to travel around the world. A good virus. Uh, the God virus called uh, mercy and steadfast love. Now John has a disturbing and uncharacteristic image of Jesus' mission. He said that Jesus would not only save the afflicted, but he will show up with a pitchfork in his hand. Wow. To winnow the chaff out of the wheat so that you have the, the good stuff left. That sounds pretty harsh. Uh, Kathy uh, Beach Verhe, uh, a, a pastor and a commentary this week, wrote or asks, um, what preacher wants to preach John's harsh criticism uh, this close to Christmas? Uh, I can relate to that. Uh, why rain on everyone's parade at this time of year? Uh, she says, this is her answer, uh, there's no getting to Bethlehem and the sweet baby Jesus in the manger without first hearing the rough prophet in the wilderness calling us to repentance, to repent of anything that blocks the good and healthy relationship we have with God and, and one another. Now, I will admit to you that something in me today wants to tell you that everything is going to be all right and to encourage you to spend the rest of Advent watching Hallmark movies, and it's a wonderful life. Uh, but John won't let me do that. He won't let us do that. He reminds us that that sweet little baby Jesus in the manger grew up and became an adult who had some harsh words of his own to the leaders of Israel, calling them blind guides, whitewashed tombs, and borrowing a line from John, a bunch of snakes. To people who tragically mistook their mission, their divine mission to preach good news of God's love to the whole world, they mistook that call to responsibility as a special and exclusive privilege for themselves alone. They turned their calling to be the light to all the nations to transform that into an exclusive mirror reflecting only their image. Nothing could have been farther from the truth in the heart of God and God's plan. They reduce God's universal, international message of salvation to a local exclusive club for people with Abraham's blood type. Not, not the message of the Bible. The great and tragic irony here is that God told Abraham in 1800 B.C. that he would make him the father of many great nations, and that through him, Abraham, God would bless all nations. That's pretty clear on what the mission was. Paul understood this probably better than most when he told the church in Rome that Abraham was not saved by keeping the law or doing good works or having the right family tree, but by his faith, believing in God and trusting God to be able to do what God promised to do. And so he and Sarah followed him to a whole new land. And the text says, Abra in Paul, uh, uh, in, in, in the, it's in Romans chapter 4, Paul says, Abraham's faith was reckoned to him as righteousness, thus making Abraham a great model for the whole world. Salvation was not earned, but granted by a gracious and loving and merciful God. And those who believe the good news and receive the gift of this grace uh, that has been made possible in the redemption which Jesus uh, came to bring for all of us. That's the good news of the gospel. And it was good because it was created for and offered to all of God's creatures. 
When I was writing a sermon uh, this week, uh, an old country song from Ann Murray uh, floated in, in the window and into my left ear. Do you remember it? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> I mean, I haven't given you any clues yet, have I? Uh, it has a wonderful, uh, I don't know the name of it, it has a great tagline. Uh, and I think it pulls uh, certainly at my heartstrings today. We sure could use a little good news today. Remember that song back in the early 80s? Uh, our world was in a pretty tough spot in those days as well. And she wrote this song, or at least she recorded it. I don't know if she wrote it, but we sure could use a little good news today. When you consider what our world has been through in the last 20 months, it's painful to remember this god-awful pandemic. All the people have died and gotten sick and, and the, the, the stress and strain that is created on all countries. And it's not over yet. The, the growing political and cultural conflict, uh, uh, not only in, in our nation, but in, in a lot of nations. Hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, volcanoes erupting, wildfires burning hundreds of thousands of acres, violence in the streets, chaos everywhere, the pain and the suffering of so many. And if that wasn't enough, we woke up on Saturday morning to hear of these deadly tornadoes taking so many lives and destroying so much property. We could all use a little good news today. Not tomorrow, but today. In many ways, this was the world into which John and Jesus came 2,000 years ago, groaning in labor pains and yearning for a Savior to come and make life good again. God's people had suffered wars and exiles and famine and disease and political oppression by Egypt and Philistia, Assyria, Babylon, Greece, and then Rome, who was occupying Israel when Jesus was born. And so when the time was right, Scripture says, God sent John into the world to prepare the way for the Messiah, the Savior, to make things good again. And when he came, tragically, many did not recognize him. You've heard me say it many times, one of the great ironies of history is that the very people who should have recognized Jesus because they had been looking for him for 600 years since the prophets started saying he was on his way, did not recognize him. On the other hand, those whom we might have excused for not perceiving Jesus to be the Christ because they were hardworking, ordinary people spending all their waking hours trying to make ends meet and having trouble doing so, uh, didn't have the time or capacity to recognize him. And yet they flocked to him in droves to hear this charismatic rabbi who was something more than a rabbi, who preached about the grace of God with such clarity and beauty and fed hungry people and healed the sick with such compassion and empathy that it compelled them to want to follow him. He came to bring the good news of God's grace and forgiveness offered to all, rich and poor, strong and weak, Jew and Gentile, men and women, free and slave. Throughout history, the world has seen prophets and religions come and go. And many of them have taught things not terribly dissimilar from what Jesus taught. Love God. Love your neighbor. Do unto others as you would have them do unto to ye. Do not kill or commit adultery or steal or lie. But with Jesus, there was a palpable difference. He not only preached these things uh, compellingly, he lived them authentically in his own life. He had love in his heart. He sought out outcasts like 
lepers and Gentiles and women and the blind and the deaf and the lost, people who were considered uh, on the edges of society in those days. In short, and we've never quite figured this out, Jesus was God in the flesh. The creator of the universe living in a carpenter's house in a small town in backwater Galilee. No wonder they didn't recognize him in Jerusalem. Who would have expected that? But isn't that the way God operates? Always showing up when and where we least expect it. Surprise. <laughs> But then again, Isaiah understood this when he wrote 2,600 years ago, God's ways are not our ways, and God's thoughts are not our thoughts. And aren't you glad? If we were in charge, we'd make a mess of things. But thank God, God has promised to walk with us, to be with us, and for us in all things, even this. Let us pray. Oh God, we are grateful that John came, you sent to prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. Oh God, we, we repent of all the limitations we place upon your love and upon the scope of Jesus' mission. But it seems clear to any who would hear that you sent him into the world not to condemn the world but to save all who would receive your gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And so we give you thanks for the meaning and the power and the glory of Christmas, the day you decided to come into our world and to take care of business <clears throat> in person. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please join with me in the reading of the Affirmation of Faith as printed in your bulletin. It is taken from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. In him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, God was pleased to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. Before we go to God in prayer, I would like to call your attention to the announcement sheet in your bulletin uh, and call attention especially to our beautiful uh, poinsettias here who are, uh, that are given in honor uh, and in memory of loved ones. And so if you'd like um, uh, to make a, a volunteer contribution for that and send in the names of your loved ones to Virginia in the office. Uh, we will be glad to list their names uh, in the Christmas Eve bulletin uh, as well as the, the Sunday following. I want to say thanks to all those who have worked on our Habitat for Humanity House. Uh, it's uh, coming along, and uh, if, if you would like to, to do that, please uh, contact Virginia or me or Amy Rhodes.
and uh, there are 16 slots available for this upcoming Saturday uh, still open. Uh, thanks again for uh, all those who generously gave uh, to our uh, special angel tree gifts for the children at Wilburn Elementary. Uh, we met our goal of uh, 26 we had signed up for and they have sent us a great uh, thank you note and we are grateful to all those who participated. Uh, there's detailed announcements here about the uh, Afghanistan house that we are uh, helping to furnish. It's actually an apartment and so if you would uh, uh, look on the back page of the announcements, uh, if there are any questions beyond this, uh, please give me or uh, Virginia or Laura Piazza a call. We have a special uh, meeting of the PKs tonight at 5 o'clock online. Uh, and there, I understand there's a special guest uh, who may appear, and uh, rumor has it that he's going to bring a, a saxophone with him. So, uh, <laughs> and that's not a threat. Uh, <coughs> but uh, anyway, the, the meeting I, I read here is open to non PK folks. So, uh, well, it, it, uh, children in heart, especially those who, uh, who love the saxophone. Uh, uh, an extremely strange instrument, to, to say the least. Um, concerns and celebrations, uh, there are a, a lot of uh, heartache this week. Um, uh, please pray for Andy uh, uh, Raby's family. His brother-in-law, Tim Osborne, passed away this week uh, uh, following a heart attack that he had uh, about a week ago. So uh, pray for the family in this time of sadness. Rick Long's brother-in-law, Charles Leinberger, passed away yesterday from an unex unexpected heart attack and leaves behind his wife and their two college-aged children. <coughs> Cheryl Anderson's good friend, Eloise Kittleman, uh, for whom she has been uh, supporting uh, with pastoral care in the past uh, several weeks as she lay in the hospital with an undiagnosed uh, cause of this illness uh, passed away this week. So uh, pray for Eloise's family and friends. Uh, Keep Karen Wayman's brother, Randy Fitzpatrick, uh, in your prayers, who's undergoing tests so that he can clear the way for his uh, knee surgery. Uh, Dorothy Denby Page got news, good news last week. The doctor said they don't need to continue with her treatment. Uh, she's doing just fine, so that's, that's great news. Uh, so please check the back of the bulletin there. Uh, Linda Brazil continues to improve. We're looking forward to her return. Uh, Richard Piazza continues to need our prayers. Virginia continues to do great. Uh, please uh, remember Patrick Smith's father, Doug, who's undergoing cancer treatment, as well as Karen Loveland, uh, and Bill Roundbush's cousin, Jane Leach, needs our prayers as well. And so does Kathy Bartley, Amy Rhodes' cousin, undergoing treatment for cancer. And just this morning, I have learned that uh, one of our Good members, J.D. Stanley, uh, who's been housebound for so long, uh, is not doing well. And so uh, please keep him in your prayers as well as his wife, Wellen, and his family. Are there other concerns or celebrations this morning? Yes. birthday Kayla <laughs> and and Donna and Jim too 
That's right. Happy birthday. My goodness. It's great to keep having birthdays, I'll tell you that. Let us go to God in prayer. Almighty and gracious God, you taught us to pray not only for ourselves, but for people everywhere. So hear us now as we pray for others in the name of Jesus. Inspire the whole church with your power, unity, and peace. Grant that all who trust you may obey your word and live together in love. Lead all nations in the way of justice and goodwill. Direct those who govern that they may rule fairly, maintain order, uphold those in need, and defend those who are oppressed, that this world may claim your rule and come to know true peace. O oh God, awaken all people to the danger we have inflicted upon the earth and plan in each of us a reverence for all that you have made that we may preserve the delicate balance of creation for all coming generations, the job you trusted us with when you called us to be its stewards. Give grace to all who proclaim the gospel through word and sacrament and deeds of mercy by their teaching and their example so that they may reveal your love for all people. Oh God, we pray that you would comfort comfort and relieve all who are in trouble today, those who sorrow from the loss of loved ones, those who find themselves in poverty, those who are afflicted with illness and disease, those who are grieving the loss of their beloved, especially those known to us whose names we have just brought before you and those we bring before you now in silence. O Lord, heal them in body, mind, or circumstance, working in them by your grace, wonders beyond all they may dream or hope. O Lord, our heart and our prayers go out to our fellow citizens in the Midwest who have suffered uh, lethal tornadoes that have taken lives and livelihood uh, and property. Oh God, we pray that you would encourage and strengthen the first responders and all those who are helping them put their, their lives and their towns uh, and their homes uh, back in order. Oh God, we are grateful that people of goodwill rise up when people are harmed and are able to help them rebuild. Oh God, bring to our remembrance all those who have served you on earth, who are now singing in your heavenly choir your praises. May their endurance in this world give us courage and their faithfulness give us hope. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us all to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.